Well, I want to uh, thank you for joining in with us uh, this morning and say Happy New Year to you. Uh, to get us started, I want to ask you to think about the, the most joyful person that you can think of. I'm not talking about the most happy, sappy kind of person that you can think about. I'm talking about a person who's authentically joyful. They breathe life and energy into you. They're uh, confident about life and uh, optimistic about the future. They're grateful for what God has given them. You have a person like that in mind? Okay. Next, I want you to think about the most joy-deprived person you can think about. Uh, they say no a lot. They complain about a lot about their life. Uh, they tend to uh, drain energy from you when you're with them. Do you, do you have a person like that? Now, it, it's almost a no-brainer for me to ask you, isn't it? Which one of those two would you prefer to spend time with? Okay? Now, for a second, think about... What's the happiest place uh, on earth? Now, I know because of millions of dollars of marketing, many of you want to say Disney World. I, I personally don't think it's Disney World. In fact, I think that the idea of a trip to Disney World is probably better than the trip to Disney World itself. And uh, I think I have evidence for you. If you wind up going on a trip to Disney World sometime, uh, you can hear conversations with parents and their little children like this because all little children want to go see Mickey. Uh, the conversation goes like this, because there's parents and their children standing in the central Florida heat, and there are long lines waiting to do what they've been dreaming about doing. And the parents inevitably have to say to the kids, do you know how much we paid to get into this place? So you're going to stand in this line, and you're going to stand in this line if it takes two hours. And you're going to ride those rides, and you're going to be happy, or I will give you something to be happy about. It's just the way life is. In fact, there's this great quote from the author... Uh, Charlotte Bronte, she said, Life is so constructed that the event does not, cannot, will not match the expectation. It will not. It cannot turn out the way that we hoped it would turn out. Now, you know, our whole culture is sort of stuck in that place right there. I mean, we're the envy of the rest of the world when it comes to wealth, when it comes to convenience, when it comes to education. In fact, there are people all over this, this planet who they work and save and some of them risk their lives to come here because to them, this is the happiest place on the planet. But for those of us who live here, the expectation, it, it, never, it ma never matches up. Life is so constructed that the event, the actual living of life, cannot, will not match our expectation. In fact, mental health experts over the last decade or so have been studying the enormous increase in depression in our current culture. In fact, uh, they talked about how in the 1960s uh, there was a certain level of depression that they could marry and, uh, measure, and even though we are richer and healthier and better educated than we are, were in the 60s, we're just richer, poorer, uh, richer healthier, uh, sad people. In fact, the average age of depression, the onset of depression, the average age for depression in the 1960s that people suffer was 29 and a half years of age. And our current culture is 14. Something is wrong. So, social scientists have been studying a lot this search for happy. What does it take for people to be happy? So we're going to launch this uh, 2015, this new year, we're going to launch with that idea of the search for happy. Now, of course, because you wound up coming to a church on the first Sunday of the new year, congratulations, you're in church. Uh, you can imagine that we're going to want to know what God has to say about it. So for the next several uh, weeks, we're going to study a little letter. We, we call it a book in the newer part of the Bible, but it's really just a letter. It's not a book. It's a letter written uh, to a church in a place called Philippi. And this little letter has long been considered the letter of joy. It's an epistle of joy. It's written by a guy named Paul. And Paul uh, is a guy who became a follower of Christ after he had long been an opponent of Christianity. And he becomes then a most outspoken advocate for Christianity. And he writes this letter. And in this letter, he mentions joy more than any other letter he writes. It's really a very short letter. And he men mentions the word joy or rejoice or rejoicing. 14 times in these uh, few short verses. And what's really interesting is Paul is writing this letter, this epistle of joy, the, uh, the book of Philippians, we call it, and he's writing it from prison. Now, 
uh, in Community Christian, we have lots of people that, <laughs> at every campus, we have people that used to be in prison. Paul was not in prison probably for what you were in prison for. Paul's in prison because it was illegal for him to teach about Jesus. In their area, it was such great persecution, like it still is in some parts of the world, to speak about Jesus. And Paul becomes this outspoken uh, advocate for people to give their lives to follow the resurrected Jesus. He's arrested and he's put in prison. And writing in prison, he's sitting in chains. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die. And he cannot stop talking about joy. So we want to look at this letter in our search for happiness and find out what Paul knew about joy. And I just want to start today by reading to you how this letter begins. We'll start in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with his overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. It's the very first time we see this word in this little letter. I always pray with joy. Always. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this. It's kind of odd. Here's Paul in prison. He's chained probably to a Roman soldier every day, and he says, I'm confident. Paul has great confidence that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion into the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart, whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. All of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, there's a surprising little truth that's found in just the very first line of this about the joyful life. Uh, Generally, in the ancient world, if you were going to write a letter, there was a formula for how you would start, very much like we have, where if you still write letters, where you would say, Dear whoever, like Dear Ed. But in their day, it would start more like this. It would say, From X to X. So it would be like from Paul to the church at Philippi. And almost always they have this little formula where then they will, if they're not well known or they will remind people of who they are, they'll start with a sort of a title. In fact, if you read other letters of Paul uh, in the New Testament, Paul has these little formulas he goes to, and he gives people his titles. Like, for instance, in the book to the church at Ephesus, the letter he wrote to them, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Or to Timothy, when he's writing, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Or in Corinth, he writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Now, in this letter to Philippi, now Paul doesn't use this word apostle, which is a, a place of authority. He doesn't try to defend, use that to describe himself. And Paul instead uses a very different term. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants, servants of Christ Jesus. Not an apostle, not someone with great authority that you have to listen to, a servant. Now, What's going on, I believe, the reason he chooses this as opposed to the one he uses in others is because of the place he's writing. Paul's trying to be very culturally relevant to them. See, Philippi was a Roman colony, unlike just other cities that the Romans would come in and take over. Philippi was a Roman colony, and so people who were citizens of Philippi were also citizens in Rome. And to be a citizen of Rome was quite different than just to live under the rule of Rome. And they saw it as quite a status symbol. And a part of being a citizen of, Rome, of, of Philippi was that they were status climbers. They were people that were about going up the ladder, about achieving status, about having wealth, about getting all that you can. And Paul, in choosing to write to this people, it, I think it may be that in this status-conscious community in the empire Paul, that's built on honor and climbing ladders, Paul chooses to say to them, I want you to understand that I'm not an apostle coming to you that you've got to demand to listen to me. Instead, I'm not somebody who's gone up the ladder. In fact, joy that I want to talk to you about comes from me being the servant. And he chooses the word that could be used for a slave. In fact, he describes himself with a word that no one in the Roman Empire would ever voluntarily choose to describe themselves as. He says, I'm not the person who's got a great place of position, a great status. Instead, I'm the servant of a great leader. A great cause. And this brings us to the core of this search for happiness. And it's what we really are going to talk about several times in this series. 
And the idea is, and if I could just get every one of us to get this deep into us, the idea is I will never be happy as long as happiness in life is my primary goal. I'm never going to be happy if being happy is the primary goal of my life. Happy, it turns out, is a byproduct of another kind of life. Happiness is something that you get along the way when you're living for something else. There's something, it turns out, that is more important than just looking for the happy life. It's the meaningful life. In fact, there's a Stanford research study that was done on this thing of happy, happy life and meaningful life, and it turns out that the happy life without meaning, it just doesn't work for human beings. That happiness is a byproduct of going for something else in your life. See, we tend to think that I'll be really happy and joy-filled if things go well, that I'll be happy if my needs get met, I'll be happy if I have the right people around me, that if my desires are satisfied, if I could just avoid pain and I can enjoy pleasure, I'll be happy. People who don't have a job tend to think, man, if I could just get a job, then I'd be happy. And then you get a job, and there's the stress, and there's all the demands of the job, and people tend to think, if I could just retire then I'd be happy. It's really interesting. Uh, again, there is worlds of research that's been done on this over the last uh, couple of decades. When people retire, you know, people long to retire and have freedom and all that. What happy happens is, is that if you put it on sort of a scale, when people retire, happiness temporarily goes up, but meaning in their life actually goes down because they, they have nowhere to contribute. They have no place to give. People get a chunk of money, and, and lots of times money's just this thing that we pursue, and we think, if I just had a little bit more money, I could be freer, I could be happy. And people who get a chunk of money, for, for just a little bit, they are happy. Happy goes up for just a short time, and they spend the money on themselves, and they buy things, and they enjoy a new car, a new house, a new, new stuff. But meaning in life tends to go down. The same thing tends to happen with people and, and their families. People who don't have kids think... Uh, we'll be a lot happier when we have kids in the house. And then you find out when you get kids in the house that, you know, you, you just can't wait to get kids out of the house. And, and then you think you'll be happy. In fact, one of the interesting things about marital satisfaction is, is that marital satisfaction tends to be higher when there aren't t kids in the house. And that when people, uh, happiness as a factor, when people don't have kids, their marital satisfaction's a little bit happier, but then they get kids. And when you get kids, I mean... We tend to have this kind of romantic view of kids where it's always going to be, you know, chubby little arms reaching out to hug your neck and they're always going to smile when you see you and they'll always make straight A's and they'll always do well and they'll always make you proud. But then you have kids and kids is a lot about dirty diapers and staying up at night and stress and worry about what's going to happen and sleep deprivation and, people, and, and kids are, are just costly. And what happens is when you get kids in the house and the stress begins to come in, often happiness in life goes down, but guess what goes up? Meaning goes up because parents give themselves to their kids and they pour into their kids and they want to make their kids uh, do well in life. And then when the kids finally leave, 18, 20, some of you 30, 40 years later, <laughs> later uh, marital satisfaction actually tends to go up, but meaning tends to go down. When people, people at the end of their lives, it turns out, Nobody stands back and looks at their life and thinks that happiness is what matters. What matters at the end of your life is, did my life matter? Was there meaning? God has made us in such a way that happiness comes as a byproduct of meaning in our life. In other words, if you aim at meaning, you will get both meaning and happiness. If you aim at happiness, you will probably wind up with neither. So what I want to do uh, in this sort of introduction to this series is I want to talk to you about some of the observations that are brought out in this little letter uh, about joy. I want to talk to you about some of the observations about the meaningful life. I want to give you some observations about a meaningful life that, I, ob that actually will lead to great joy. Here's the first one. Joy comes when I practice acts of kindness and generosity. Joy doesn't necessarily, it turns out, come to me when I get everything it wants. It turns out that joy comes to me when I help other people get what they need. Joy doesn't necessarily come to me when I get every need I have met, but when I help other people get what they need. In fact, 
Paul, in this ladder-climbing, status-seeking kind of society to Philippi, says to them, in your personal relationships, I want you to have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. I want you to begin to think just like Jesus, who was in very nature God. He was God. But he decided that that status should not be held on to. Instead, he became a servant. I want you to become, when you think about your relationships with other people, that idea of a servant. In fact, Jesus, who's a follower, actually says he didn't climb up a ladder. He, Jesus descended the ladder and became a servant. And he says to us that even a cup of cold water given in his name is not without reward. It turns out that joy is actually more associated with what we give than what we get. It turns out the most, in fact, again, studies on this, that the most reliable kind of uh, idea of uh, activity that will uh, produce joy in a person's life is how much they have the ability to give in acts of kindness and generosity. The single most reliable activity to determine a people, person's joy in life is the level of their generosity. And many of you know this. In fact, many of you have experienced it again and again. We just came off, if, if you're new around Community Christian, uh, what for many of us is the single most joyous time of the year at our church. And it's not Christmas, though it's around that time, it's what we call do something. In do something, every year I see it happen where we week after week stretch you about bringing canned goods or helping out with our Thanksgiving meal for the community or giving at Christmas time. And we watched this year again as you stretched yourself to grab names and give to kids who you will never know in the way that you would give for your own kids and to bring joy to these people that needed help. We watch as you sponsor kids in Haiti. And every year I see it as people stretch and give like they don't give any other time of the year that people will come up to me and say, I love this. I love this time of year. It's just a part of what we know, that when I practice acts of kindness and generosity, I mean, we think I'm going to be happy if I get what I want, but it turns out that I get happy and meaning when it turns out that I give and I'm generous. It turns out, in fact, that Jesus, the one we follow, was just right when he said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And he said it doesn't even have to be big things. Just a simple act like a cup of cold water given in my name, you'll receive a reward for that. So, this week is kind of a first experiment for us as we are in the search of happiness and joy. I want to give you an assignment. Your assignment this week is to do an act of kindness for somebody. And I'd encourage you to start with the people closest to you. Start the people that you're around all the time. Find something small. It doesn't have to be this great big thing. It doesn't have to be costly in any way. Run an errand for somebody. Do a project uh, for them at home. Voluntarily help somebody out with something they have to do. If you really want to have fun, then find somebody at work that you have a really hard time being around and, and do something for them sort of in secret. Do them a favor for no reason at all. Take brownies to a neighbor. Go visit somebody in the nursing home. And by this act of generosity and kindness, see, I mean, just a cup of cold water given in Jesus' name. There will be meaning, and as you give meaning to that kind of thing, then joy comes. Observation number two. Suffering can interrupt a happy life, but suffering is powerless to stop a meaningful life. Suffering and happiness, as you can imagine, they're just almost incompatible. But it is not true about suffering and joy. In fact, some of the most authentic joy... The one of the way you judge authentic joy is, is it compatible with suffering? It's, joy is like those flowers that just shoot up through the cracks of a sheet of concrete. It just can't be stopped. In fact, I told you that Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi uh, while he's sitting in prison. He's wondering about his life. And he starts the letter by saying to them, I give thanks for you every time I think of you. But the truth is that when we read about how Paul first interacted with the people in this colony of Philippi. There wasn't much about the circumstances there that would have led him to any kind of joy in thinking about them. In fact, you can read about this in the book of Acts where Paul first comes to Philippi, and when he gets there, he's teaching them about Jesus, the resurrected Savior, and how they ought to give their life to him. And there's so much opposition to him that 
He gets arrested. He gets beaten. I mean, in fact, let me, just, let me just put this verse up and show you. I mean, think about this actually happening to you. Think about how you would respond. He's severely beaten. He's stripped. He's arrested. He's thrown in jail, and his feet are put in stocks. Now, that's not like stocks like the stock market. It's like his feet are, are locked up, and he can't move. The Philippians say to Paul, you're so happy. We'll give you something to be happy about. And then Watch how Paul responds. How would you respond? You're beaten, you're stripped, naked, you're in jail, all for doing what was a good thing for them to tell them about Jesus. How would you respond? Here's Paul's response. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Arrested, beaten, humiliated, in jail for the sake of Jesus. And they're singing hymns of praise and the other prisoners were listening to them. I love that phrase. Like, I mean, you're in jail. Like, what else other choice do you have? You have crazy, beaten, naked guys singing down the hall. Of course they were listening to them. It turns out that two prisoners, Paul and Silas, turned a jail into the happiest place on earth. See, suffering is just a part of the world we live in. It's the way our world is. And it is either part of your life right now, or it will be one day. And happiness is incompatible with suffering. But suffering can do nothing to stop authentic joy. And you can choose, and many do, to allow suffering just to totally take them off a road and to become negative and self-focused. You can choose to be miserable and negative and cynical and just be in, live your life in chronic despair. But that response really isn't going to take you anywhere good. See, the best response to suffering isn't hopelessness. It's usefulness. It isn't praying in the midst of your suffering, Oh God, get me out of this. It's saying, God, how could you use me in this circumstance? And we can all do that in the face of, su the face of suffering. I mean, we can sponsor a kid, a hung hungry, uneducated child in, in, in Haiti through 410 Bridge. I can sponsor them. I can write to them. I can help people in need here. Even in the midst of my own suffering, I can reach out and help others. And I'll say this lightly. I know that even today, there's some of you joining in today, and right now you're in the midst of something that is horrible. You lost a job, or you lost your health, or you lost somebody that you care about. And your suffering is so enormous. Some of you are in severe depression. In fact, somebody listening to me right now, you're so severely depressed that you've thought about just being done with it. You can't even get the energy to think about even continuing to live. And it took all of your energy just to get up and join in with us today. And I just want to say to you, I'm so thankful you came. I'm so glad you decided to join in with us. Let me just say to you, this isn't the kind of place where you, you have to act like you've got it all together. I mean, look around you. There's no one around you that has it all together. I mean, literally, take a look. Are these well-adjusted people? If you think so, you need, to, you need to look again. We aren't. This isn't the kind of place where you have to put on a happy face and you have to act like everything's all together. Nobody has, here is a normal, healthy person. We're all messed up. We don't have to act like we're not. We're just people who follow the one who gives us joy in the midst of suffering. In fact, one of my favorite passages from the Old Testament is where the psalmist says, Suffering may last for the night. Weeping may last through the night. But joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. And I don't know when your morning's going to come. It may come tomorrow. It may come next month. It may be next year. It may be a decade from now. It, it may not be in this life, but joy will come to you. So join us in following the one, the joy bringer, Jesus, and learn from him with us how to find joy in the midst of the suffering in this world. Observation number three. Meaning comes when I invest most deeply in what matters most, and that's people. What matters more than anything else? To God, well, that's people. People matter to God, even though God may never matter to them, they still matter to him. And so people matter to Paul. That's why Paul says to them, I thank God for you 
every time I remember you. Again, let's think about it. When he's in Philippi, there is nothing about this place that gave him any kind of circumstance to make him want to be thankful for him. But Paul says, every time I pray, I'm grateful. In my prayers, I'm always, I always pray for you, he says, with great joy. Mostly life. Mostly life is, is about relationships. It, it, is, it is impossible to live a, ha- a, a happy life and have unhappy relationships. And it is impossible to live a joyless life and to have joy-filled relationships. Our life is just about our relationships. In fact, again, one of the studies that's been done in the last few years was done by a socioeconomic group that found that people tend to think that if I had more money, I'd be happy, but that getting more money does very little for happiness. In fact, they found that investing deeply in relationships, getting more relationally connected, that making a difference and how deeply connected you are has a bigger push on people's life than getting an extra hundred thousand dollars in income so just a practical application for that is is like today if you just want to get more joy you could decide to give me like eighty thousand dollars i will be your friend i'll be happy and you'll still be twenty thousand dollars ahead so we all win i mean just think about paul here's paul financially he's dirt poor relationally He's filthy rich. This is Paul's life. This is life and the reality of the kingdom of God with Jesus. Every time I remember you, I'm grateful for you. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for my friends in Philippi. Every time I think of you, it just makes me joyful. And I'm, I'm spending much more time in building into relationships. So I ask you, where are you spending most of your time? Are you spending time in climbing your own personal ladder of how you can get people to look to you and your status? Or are you investing in people and growing relationships that way? I mean, how many of us, if we were honest, we'd actually, in our prayers, if we were truthful about our prayers, they would be more like this. God, every time I think of them, I'm asking, why can't you fix him? Why can't you make her better? God, why can't you put... Happy, joy-filled people around me. God, make me have happy people around me. Who are you grateful for? Tell them. Paul writes this whole letter to Philippi, and honestly, this whole letter exists primarily as a thank you note. Again and again, Paul thanks them for their partnership, for the money they send, for, for the love that they give him, for the way that they watch after him. He was so grateful, and it brought him such great joy. Final observation. The happy life is rooted in where I am, you know, physically, in my circumstances, financially, or what's going on with my health. But the meaningful life, it's rooted in where I am spiritually. There's no circumstance, there's no external situation that can bring lasting internal happiness. Paul writes this church, a letter to Philippi, but he's, he addresses to them not where they are physically, but who they are spiritually. He says to them, he calls them saints, holy in God. It's as if Paul reminds them, I know you're in this colony and everybody's trying to climb the ladder, but it doesn't matter where you are on the ladder. It matters whose you are. Paul says, your location doesn't matter all that much at all. It's your spiritual location that matters. Paul's saying, if you're really a follower of Jesus Christ and a meaning-filled servant of his, then All the temporary trappings of Philippi don't have anything to do with the joy in your life. It's whose you are. What matters most is not whether you're in Philippi or Georgia or where you are. It matters whose you are in in Jesus. It's that you're his. What does that mean? That means that Jesus is in me. And Jesus is for me. And Jesus is beside me. Jesus is with me every moment. Jesus is always working through me. He's always working in me. He's always in front and goes before me. He's always got my back. He's in my heart. He's by my side. Jesus is around me at every place. I may be in trouble. I may have bad health. I may have people that are against me. But if Jesus is with me, I am good to go. Paul says, your spiritual location is in Christ Jesus. Therefore, your geographical location or your your circumstances in life with job or health, it does not matter. Your well-being is not at risk as long as you are in Christ Jesus. 
For joy is not a feeling. Paul does not say to them, hey, be in a good mood. Paul says to them to rejoice in the Lord. Dallas Willard says, joy is a pervasive sense of well-being. And only God can give that. It comes from following Jesus, the joy giver. Joy is rooted in my spiritual life. So can I draw your attention to the connection card for a minute? Would you go ahead and find one of those cards that's probably on the seat nearby you, and maybe you sat down on it, and would you go ahead, and, if you haven't already, begin to fill it out. And we ask you to fill it out individually, not as a family, because yet you need to take spiritual next steps individually. And every week we ask you, you know, that it's not so much about just coming and getting information, it's about deciding that I'll take a step to being what God wants me to be. You know, in our world... There's so much focus on finding the happy life, but what we really all want is, I want joy. I want a pervasive sense of well-being that God is with me, and I'm okay no matter what, no matter what my circumstances. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about that. So would you decide that you're going to take some next steps toward that? Maybe your next step is that you're going to check the box and say, I'm just going to, I'm going to read through this book, the little book of Philippians, this little letter. Oh, at least once a week over the, the five weeks of this series. I'm going to read that every week. Or maybe you decide, you know, I'm in a place where I need to invest in people. I need to pour more deeply into people. So maybe that means getting involved uh, in a small group. You could start the whole new year with, with a small group uh, uh, this week. Or maybe it's time for you to invest in serving other people and giving your life away to other people and you want to get involved in a serving team. Or maybe there's some spiritual roadblock that has you in place and, you're going to figure that out. If you just fill out that card, check a next step, drop it in the offering when it comes by, we'll pray for you and help you if we can as you take those next steps. And can I say just a word for a second to those of you who are visiting with us? You know, when the offering comes around, really all we want you to put in there is this card. You don't need to feel obligated to give. This service is our gift to you, and we have a book as a gift out near the information center that we'd love for you to pick up. It talks about the story of God and how you fit in. It's been a great help for a number of people in, in finding spiritual roadblocks and how to get over them in your life. And we'd love for you to pick that up. And we'd love to know that you were here, but more than that, we'd just love for you to come back and join with us again, to be with us again next week. We're so honored that you came. And I hope that all of you will come back and you'll join with us as we learn, as followers of Christ, to rejoice in the Lord always as we begin to follow Jesus, the joy bringer. For God, the God of great joy, what we just celebrated Christmas tells us that he became a man of sorrow so that those sinners like us of great sorrow could become people of joy. And when Jesus came, we beat him and mocked him and hung him on a cross. We killed him. And three days later, God went to the place of death, the place of great despair. And God said to us, I'll give you something to be happy about. And he turned the grave into the happiest place on earth as Jesus was resurrected. And that's who we follow. That's who we learn from. We hope you'll come and learn with us. Let's bow together and I'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to know you. And just that fact alone, it, it helps us to live with great joy that, that you care about us and you see us and you know us. Father, would you help us to learn that there is more to this life than being happy? Would you help us as we go on the search for meaning in our lives? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.